Pass. 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 Smash. Doubt is such a strange thing. I mean, it's, um, you know, there'll be times where you succeed and there are times that you fail. So waste, wasting your time doubting whether you're going to be successful or not is pointless. It is. I mean, you just put one foot in front of the other. You control what you can't control. And then you see what the outcome is. Right? If you win, great. You're going to have to wake up the next day and do the journey over again. If you lose, it sucks. But you're going to have to wake up the next day and do the journey all over again anyway. What's the number one thing that's holding most people back from reaching their full potential? The story. The story they sell themselves on. Everyone's got a story. And everyone wants to tell you their story of how bad they had it, how hard they had it. And the more times you tell yourself or others that story, the more you reinforce the fact that you're not meant to have happiness, success, abundance, great relationship, awesome health, abs, whatever. They don't realize that they still hold the pen. And there's thousands of empty pages still in that book that they can rewrite that story. But we have to let go of the pages that others have written in our book and realize we got this pen. And we can start writing how the story looks from this day forward. Welcome everyone, Ep welcome to episode number 168 of The State of Fitness. Today is what, April 19th, 2023. Thank you for joining me. As always, I hope you're doing well. If this is your first time joining, joining us, welcome. I'm David Greenwalt. I'm the founder of Leanest Lifestyle University. For 24 years and counting now, I've been using science and experience to help our clients lose the excess one more time for the last time so they can live their best life with the body and the fitness they desire. So for first timers, each Wednesday, which this is, if you're live with me, on these states of fitness, I discuss anything weight management oriented, health or fitness oriented, anything that's top of mind related to fitness for the week. This state of fitness is my 168th uh, in a row since February 5th, 2020. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel here and you like what I'm doing, please do subscribe. It'll help keep you in the loop. You won't get bombasted with uh, messages or anything. We don't do it for that, but it kind of helps us out. It lets YouTube know that we're liked by a few people, all right? So uh, let's start off by taking a quick look at some student highlights from this past week, okay? Looks like that's showing up okay. Good deal, good deal. All right, I'm gonna do a little different this week. Just wanted to shake it up a little bit. Um, nothing crazy, but I just wanted to highlight some students and just give a few student shout outs um, who uh, achieved some cool things this week. So I'm leaving the last names off because uh, my states of fitness are open to people on the email list and people that aren't members um, uh, some of the times, and this is one of those times. So uh, I want to give a shout out to Kimberly G for maintaining. You know, a lot of our students. The whole objective here is to lose the weight one more time for the last time. So we really like to make sure that we highlight the students that have gotten to goal and are still maintaining because, you know, as so, so many of us know, you know, the fanfare and the parades and the confetti, uh, that all usually happens when we're in action and we're losing weight and people start noticing, oh my gosh, what are you doing? You've lost this or what, you know, what are you doing? Tell me, tell me what's going on. I'm really noticing things. But once we're in maintenance a while, that fanfare really goes down. So we like to make sure that we continue to support what we're here to do, which is to get the weight off and keep it off, um, and also to highlight the students that are doing that. So Kimberly G is doing that. She's maintained a 21 pound loss for 144 days. Way to go, Kimberly. Kim L achieved her five week goal. Within our program, we set goals uh, five, in five week increments. Not too long, not too short. If you get into trouble, it's not gonna be that long and you're gonna get a reset. Um, and also the goal isn't that far out. It's not 26 weeks out where you're like, oh my gosh, this goal is going to be 26 weeks before I get to say I accomplished it. We keep adding those five-week stepping stone goals together until we get to our ultimate. So Kim L has achieved her five-week goal and she's down 42 pounds. Now she didn't lose 42 pounds in five weeks. She's, um, as I said, she has stacked these five-week goal successes together and she's now down 42 pounds though. She just achieved another five-week goal. 
Phyllis M is maintaining 27 pounds lost for 1,200 days. 1,200 days, 365 days in a year. Um, I know that at like 14, what is it? 1,460 days, she will have earned her PhD. She will have kept the weight off uh, for four consecutive years. So unbelievable, way to go, Phyllis. Cindy S, um, newer, and she has achieved uh, one of her five-week goals and all in, she has uh, lost and she's down 21 pounds. So way to go, Cindy, outstanding work. Um, I got a message, you know, I was conversing with a, a student today, one of our male students, and um, he's been with me a long time. And that's in the, and, and in our conversation, he wrote me this. He says, I've been an LLU member for 20 years. I've had my stumbles along the way, but I've never gotten close to the 230 pounds from when I started. Thanks for all the support and guidance. My life would be very different without LLU and not in a positive way. This is a male student maintaining a 45 pound fat loss. So been maintaining it for, for quite a while now, doing really well. So anyway, it just means a lot to me. Um, I just wanna thank him uh, on this anonymously so much. It, it really does mean a lot. I don't take any of it for granted. I really don't, thanks so much. Becca, I gotta highlight Becca. I'm gonna be highlighting some you know students more. So um, I've got some others that I'm gonna be sharing too, but I gotta, I gotta give Becca a shout out here. Down 90 pounds. She's going for 10 more. Her start date was June of 2021. She hit the 90 pound mark um, in June of 2022. And she's decided kind of recently that she wants to go down about 10 more. So way to go, Becca. I mean, look at that. Look at the picture. It's just unbelievable, isn't it? I mean, it's just uh, so happy. I've I had the privilege. I'll share a picture. I haven't shared this on our Facebook group. But I had the privilege earlier this year to meet Becca and her husband um, when Mary and I were in Florida, in person, in person. So I'll share the picture. We had a good time. And anyway, congratulations, Becca. Outstanding work. And we're really, really proud of you. Top maintainers list. Want to keep this one in. Again, it's what we're all about. Lose it one more time for the last time. All of these students have achieved their, have achieved their lifetime goal. They've all... Uh, kept within 10 pounds of their lifetime goal for the number of days you see in the days column. They've kept off the amount of weight you see in the weight lost column. Okay, so we've got students that have kept off just a few pounds for a few days, but they've achieved their lifetime goal. And we've got students that have kept off, you know, almost 150 pounds for more than a thousand days. So the students in green have kept their weight off for at least a year, at least 365 days. They're what we call master's candidates. Um, you earn your bachelor's when you've achieved your lifetime goal and you've graduated from Lifestyle 180. Okay, that's how it works here. When you've graduated Lifestyle 180 and you've achieved your lifetime goal, both, then you've earned your bachelor's in personal weight management. You earn your master's when you've kept that weight off within 10 pounds for two consecutive years. The students in green have kept their weight off for at least a year. Um, I want to give a shout out to Kelly, who is at 353 days and almost... Uh, ready to hit that year mark. So congratulations, Kelly, you're coming up on it. And then I want to give a shout out to Jenna at 731 days because she just, just moved into the master's category. She has now earned her master's. 730 days is two consecutive years. So Jenna has now moved beyond bachelor's. She has earned her master's and she is now also a PhD candidate and she will earn her PhD, as will all the people in orange, they will earn their PhD when they've kept the weight off for 1,460 days. That's four consecutive years, holding it within 10 pounds, okay? So congratulations to all the students in the green, all the students in the orange who, are, who have earned their masters and are PhD candidates. And I wanna give a shout out to Joy, who is a, a PhD candidate. She's earned her master's. She's in yellow there under the blue, but she's getting close. 1,460 days and she will have earned her PhD. Means she will have maintained her weight, her goal weight within 10 pounds for four consecutive years. Way to go, Joy, keep it going, you're close. And the students in blue have earned their PhD. They've earned the highest level you can achieve at LLU. They have maintained their weight within 10 pounds for four consecutive years. Way to go, everybody. Way to exemplify what everyone is here to do. Okay? Outstanding work. Um, all right. Let's see. So I think it was back in episode 166, I did a lesson that I titled Tension Reliever or Goal Achiever. And at the end of that one, I had this slide. 
and many of us or maybe all of us are so familiar with this sentiment you know choose your heart losing weight is hard being overweight is hard choose your heart and in the tension reliever goal achiever lesson I went down, I really expanded it, and I really uh, went a lot deeper than what I've seen elsewhere. And I, and I covered the aspects of the fact that for both tension reliever and goal achiever, there is pleasure and pain and a flow of energy. And it has to do with the duration of pleasure, the duration of pain, and the flow of energy. So where I, the reason I'm showing you this now and I want to show you a couple uh, new ones is I kind of kicked myself after that because I was like, everybody shows the choose your heart. Now, I had already given a, probably a 25, 30 minute lesson to build up for this. There was a lot more understanding over what it means to, for, to be a tension reliever versus goal achiever. But I think a lot of people, you know, and it just kind of drives me crazy, which is why I'm, I'm doing this, are left with that still that same sentiment, choose your heart, right? Um, Losing weight is hard. Being overweight is hard. But I really should have mentioned this. Losing weight is easy. Being overweight is easy. Choose your easy. That you don't ever see anywhere. But it goes perfectly with the tension reliever goal achiever lesson. Losing weight is easy. What do you mean losing weight is easy? Well, if you caught episode 166... You know what I mean? The duration of pleasure, when you're in maintenance and you're cruising along, does it still take energy? Yeah, and I'll talk about that All right, uh, just briefly because I'm not going to cover the whole lesson. I just want to briefly mention this. Is it easier waking up every day with your energy flowing in a positive direction, your systems in place, your, your structure of accountability, if you still need it, that's been in place for a long time. Your meal plans, if you've already got all that figured out. It's not front brain work. It's like brushing your teeth. The exercise is mostly on, you know, on a pattern and you're feeling good. In that regard, where pleasure is a very long duration, because each day you get to live in the body you created, um, you get to live the life that you want and deserve. There's a form of easy there. There really is. So losing weight is easy. The losing can be easy and the maintaining can be easy, both. Because when you make that decision to forego the fast food joint, there is pain in the moment that's short term, but the pleasure for doing it is long term, even while you're losing weight. So losing weight is easy, being overweight is easy. If you make that instantaneous decision to go through the drive through that's easy. If you choose convenience, always convenience, over going long, that's easy in the moment. It's easy short term. Losing weight, maintaining weight, easy long term. Being overweight, easy short term. Choose your easy. Energy to lose weight is high. Energy to gain weight is high. Choose your energy. You know, in that lesson I said, we're talking about duration of pleasure, duration of pain, and then the flow and amount of energy. Well, it takes a lot of energy, especially in the beginning, to lose weight. You got to think about your foods. You got to think about planning. You got to think about prepping. What about the exercise? How do you do it? Do you know what to do? Do you know how to do strength training? Um, how do you work it in? What's, how do you get it into your schedule? On and on and on. For a lot of people in the beginning, it takes a lot of energy to get all of those things in place. So energy to lose weight is high. But the flow of energy the energy you're putting out is moving you in a positive direction. The flow is positive. You are moving forward. You are moving beyond your status quo. You are moving beyond a stagnant place. You are moving beyond continuing to gain weight. You are moving in a positive direction. The energy is moving you toward a positive place. The energy could be high, but the flow is positive. The energy to gain or stay the same where you don't want to be is high. It takes a lot of energy to wake up each day not being where you want to be. It takes a lot of energy each day to wake up and realize that it's still something you want to do. The energy of what, what you feel about yourself, trying to find the clothes that fit, um, trying to figure out how you're going to manage social situations, whatever it is for you, 
the energy is draining. It's extremely energy demanding to gain weight or even stay the same where you don't want to be. So, energy to lose is high, the energy to gain is high. Choose your energy. So it really is, choose your hard, but also choose your easy. Because losing weight and maintaining absolutely can be thought of as easy if we think about the long-term aspects. And choose your energy. Energy to lose is high, energy to gain is high. Choose your energy. What direction do you want? It's still gonna take a lot of energy to lose, it's still going to take a lot of energy to gain or stay the same. It takes a lot of energy. No, it's just easier. No, it's not. It's not just easier. There are parts of it that are easier short term, but the long term is not easier. It takes a lot of energy and it's flowing in a negative direction. So, all right. So now I feel better. You've had that. <laughs> choose your hard, choose your easy, choose your energy. Um, all right. Let me see here. Put you back here for just a second. Real quick. So moving on. There was a study that came out not too long ago um, about exercise and depression. So I want to talk about depression just a little bit and then about what that research piece said that's gotten a lot of attention, still continues to get a lot of attention, so I thought it would be good to bring it to you guys this week. So I want to talk about depression a little bit. I'll start you off with that, not real long, and then I'm going to talk about exercise and its impact on depression from a research-based perspective, okay? All right, so first off, depression is a widespread mental health condition in the United States. It's widespread. According to a September 22 uh, study published in the American Journal of Preventive Medicine, which is on the screen there, nearly 10% of Americans suffer from depression. Nearly 10% with the mood disorder increasing fastest among teens and young adults. Between 2015 and 2020, Incidents of depression reached 9% among Americans 12 and older, and among teens and young adults, the depression rate stood at 17%. That was in 2020. According to the National Institute of Mental Health in 2020, an estimated 17.3 million adults in the U.S. had at least one major depressive episode in the past year. Depression affects people of all ages, races, ethnicities, and socioeconomic backgrounds. Women are more likely than men to experience depression, with an estimated 9.2% of adult women experiencing a major depressive episode, compared to 5.3% of adult men as of 2020. It's important to note that uh, the uh, statistics I'm sharing with you, they only represent diagnosed cases of depression, diagnosed. And many people with depression, uh, they don't necessarily seek or receive treatment. Therefore, the actual prevalence of depression in the United States is probably higher than the numbers I'm sharing with you. It's not an overstatement to say that depression has reached epidemic proportions. And what, you know, what classifies it as epidemic? Well, epidemic just means that the issue is widespread and has become a significant public health concern that requires urgent action. So this study, a February 23 study published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine has gotten a lot of deserved attention because of headlines like this. Physical activity is 1.5 times more effective at reducing mild to moderate symptoms of depression, psychological stress, and anxiety than medication or cognitive behavior therapy. That was uh, the lead author, author of this study I'm going to share with you, Dr. Ben Singh, who uh, was quoted as saying that. So let's take a look at it. So the authors looked at nearly 100 meta-studies of randomized, control st uh, randomized controlled trials and found that Exercise is more beneficial for conditions such as anxiety and depression than standard psychotherapy or medications. Essentially, all forms of exercise produced significant mental health benefits with shorter, high-intensity exercise programs producing the greatest benefit. Beyond the positive benefits of high-intensity exercise, like I've talked about this before, high-intensity exercise, you know, especially high-intensity interval training, usually goes much shorter than uh, slow and steady, uh, exercise, um, you know, low intensity, steady state exercise, as it's often called. And there are benefits to the high intensity interval training. Shorter, more intense, typically increases in fitness. You can burn more calories in a shorter period of time, all that kind of stuff. But I really want to see what did they define as, you know, because uh, they're saying that there were uh, positive benefits of high intensity exercise. And uh, 
and with that with that shorter exercise, high intensity shorter exercise, not necessarily interval training, but high intensity shorter exercise. Well, the authors hypothesized. I had to look at the research because I was like, "What do you? Why? Why? Why did you guys come to that? You know, uh, hypothesis?" The authors hypothesized that maybe shorter bouts of exercise, which they defined as less than thirty minutes, were simply adhered to more and better than long duration duration exercise, which they defined as greater than sixty minutes. So adherence was the key in their hypothesis as to why the shorter form might have worked better for depression. Because you would think that, you know, you would think that it would be kind of a dose-dependent thing. Like, if, not that you should exercise five hours a day, but, you know, if we're talking 20 minutes of exercise versus, say, an hour, um, we would think that we might just kind of, say, rationally or, say, common sense-wise think that, that there's going to be a better impact on depression because of the longer exercise. They didn't find that to be true. It doesn't mean it's not true, but they didn't find that to necessarily be true. The difference isn't that huge, by the way. So it's not like, oh, you know, I'm not going to be able to alleviate my anxiety and depression if I just do, you know, a longer, moderate workout. Not true at all. Still has huge positive benefits. And the extra positive benefit from the shorter uh, duration, high intensity exercise is not that great. There's some benefit. But um, would each of us really be able to tell the difference? Hard to say. I wouldn't count on it. Both are great. But I wanted to, but I wanted to be able to differentiate what do they classify as shorter, under 30 minutes? What do they classify as long, 60 minutes or greater? And um, why did they think that the shorter was better than the long? Well, they thought it was about ad adherence. Okay. So the study concluded that physical activity should be a legitimate first-line treatment for mental health issues and not just an added extra as it's often seen in medicine. So if you've been with me a while here, you've heard me say repeatedly that I don't believe the top benefit of exercise is the caloric burn. I haven't for a long time. I've said I believe the greatest benefit of exercise is the mental and emotional fitness benefits that we can derive from it. Um, the overall fitness improvements we can get from doing it, excuse me, maybe a close second behind the mental and, and emotional fitness benefits. And then with the caloric burn, maybe somewhere in that third position. So, if, and also if you've been with me a while, you've heard me say over and over and over that one study is not the end all be all. This is what I shared with you was one study from February, 2023. Now it was a massive study. Over a hundred meta reviews were included. And a meta review is a review of a bunch of studies. So this was, a study of a hundred studies that were of a bunch of studies. I mean, it was a massive review and it's one of the reasons it's gotten the highlight it has. Um, but it really kind of continues to echo what has already been out there. So I want to kind of overwhelm you a little bit if I can and share with you some other research because one study does not mean it's all true. One study is never the end all be all. So let's take a quick look at some other research and see what they've said about exercise and mental health. In the exercise group, statistically significant improvements were observed in subjects with moderate and severe depression, 18 and 22% respectively, and in those with symptoms of anxiety. The journal is there, the year is there, let's keep going. Moderate and high intensity exercise improved depression levels while very low intensity exercise did not have as beneficial an effect. Exercise has a large and significant antidepressant effect in people with depression, including major depressive disorder. The presented evidence suggests that exercise and physical activity have beneficial effects on depression symptoms and are capable, or I'm sorry, and that are comparable to those of antidepressant treatments. Exercise had a positive effect on the therapeutic response in depression treatment. Ex physical exercise can be an effective treatment against depression. Pretty simple there, right? Physical exercise is an effective intervention for depression. Patients with depressive symptoms indicative of mild to moderate depression and for whom exercise training improves function-related outcomes achieve the largest antidepressant effects. This one I thought was kind of cool. And boy, can I relate. I have many times as I've gone through back issues and I've been debilitated for this, that, and that, I've had to work through therapy and I've had to back way off and I have felt like a half a person. I didn't feel like a whole person. Um, if you've had things happen to you, you I know you're going to relate to what I'm saying there. You just don't feel like a whole person. When I was able to get back to doing things 
that I could do before. When I felt more whole, my blues, sadness, some elements of depression for sure were alleviated greatly or just completely removed. And that's what they're talking about here. That when a person can get back, you know, or improve their function-related outcomes, they can feel more like a whole person. Um, this is just one aspect of how exercise could be an antidepressant. All right? So I like that one. Data of randomized controlled trials suggest higher sizes for the effect of exercise on, an on anxiety and depression, leading to increases up to moderate and large effects, respectively. Implications for rehabilitation from mild to moderate depression. The effect of exercise may be comparable with antidepressant medication and psycho uh, psychotherapy. For severe depression, exercise seems to be a valuable complementary therapy to the traditional treatments. These data suggest that the beneficial effects of exercise may extend to breast cancer patients with depression and may be initiated prior to and during cancer treatment. Our data suggests that exercise is effective in improving anxiety symptoms in people with a current diagnosis of anxiety and or stress-related disorders. This study concluded that exercise had definitely helped in reducing the depressive symptoms, anxiety, and improved the self-esteem and quality of life of patients with depression. Last but not least, exercise has therapeutic effects on depression in all age groups, mostly 18 to 65 years old, year olds, as a single therapy, an adjuvant therapy, or a combination therapy. And the benefits of exercise therapy are comparable to traditional treatments for depression. It isn't just one study. This is just a, a smattering of studies that are out there talking about the benefits of exercise on anxiety and depression and mental health. It's huge. It is I would say arguably at consensus level. Consensus doesn't mean everybody agrees, but consensus means that most experts, researchers, people that are in the know, that are not bought and paid for, you know, in any way, shape, or form, that are really in the know, agree. Um, it's there. So for the love of God, get your exercise in. If you haven't been feeling that great mentally, emotionally, get your exercise in. It can be an antidepressant. It can help alleviate anxiety and depression. Please get your exercise in. We need it for our mental health, even if we don't get anything else from it, which we will. Um, if you're a member and you need help with exercise, whether it's the cardio or the strength side, because the research has been uh, pretty clear too on the strength. Strength exercise can also Im improve anxiety and depressive symptoms. So cardio, strength, get your sweat on, um, even if it's minimal, but get your sweat on. Um, so if you need help, there's always a way. If you're a member, find me. I'll help you figure it out. There's always a way, no matter how many hours you, you work in a week, no matter what's going on. And if you're not ha hospitalized, we can get some exercise in and get you feeling better mentally um, and also physically as well, right? It's going to help it's every, every way we can imagine. All right. Next up this week, I wanted to let you know about this. Uh, Two states that have proposed bans on five common food additives uh, linked to health concerns. It's, it's new. So I want to let you know about it and use it as a teaching to tool. So here's what to know about the five chemicals which most often show up as we are not going to be surprised to hear in ultra-processed foods like baked goods, candy, and soda. So state legislators of two states are seeking to prohibit the manufacturing and sale of products containing additives. And these additives act as preservatives or to enhance color, texture, or taste. But these additives have also been linked to cancer, neurodevelopmental issues, and hormone dysfunction. The legislators collaborated with nonprofit groups like Consumer Reports and the Environmental Working Group, and they looked for additives that were prohibited in Europe, but are still widely used in the United States, and where research shows a strong evidence of health risks. So the five additives named in the bills are all found almost exclusively, as I said, in ultra-processed foods. Um, so what are the five? Number one, red dye number three. This is used in nearly 3,000 food products, including icings, nutritional shakes, mar maraschino cherries, and peppermint berry and cherry-flavored candies. It's been shown to cause cancer in animals, which prompted the U.S. Food and Drug Administration to ban its use in cosmetics in 1990. At the time, the agency said 
it would work to extend the ban to food, but the chemical remains in use today. There are also concerns that it and other synthetic food dyes may contribute to behavioral problems such as hyperactivity in children. You don't say. Number two, titanium dioxide. This acts as a whitener, color enhancer, and anti-caking agent in thousands of food items. It's present in many candies, as well as baked goods, creamy salad dressings, and frozen dairy products like cheese, pizza, and ice cream. A safety assessment conducted by the European Food Safety Authority in 2021 concluded that titanium dioxide damages DNA and can harm the immune system, resulting in its ban in the EU um, in 2022. Number three, brominated vegetable oil. This serves as an emulsifier in fruit drink and so does. So what's an emulsifier? An emulsifier helps to mix ingredients that would otherwise separate, like oil and water. Research in rats, including a study published by the FDA in 2022, suggests that brominated vegetable oil acts as an endocrine disruptor, especially affecting the thyroid hormone. Anybody got thyroid issues out there? An earlier study found that it can also harm the reproductive system, because of its potential risks, many large brands, including Coca-Cola and Pepsi, recently stopped using the chemical, but it's still in some smaller and grocery store beverage brands. Number four, potassium bromate. This is primarily found in baked goods, including breads, cookies, and tortillas, where it acts as a leavening agent and improves texture. The additive is classified as being, quote, possibly, car possibly carcinogenic by humans or to humans, unquote by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, based on studies conducted in animals. And number five, what do we got here? Uh, propylparaben, right? That's what it is, propylparaben. This is a preservative used in packaged baked goods, particularly pastries and tortillas. It's also present in many cosmetics and personal care products. Numerous studies in humans and animals indicate that propylparaben acts as an endocrine disruptor, and affects male and female reproductive health. So, if you remember from a while back, not that long ago, and I bring it out from time to time. I'm going to keep bringing it out because I like it. Um, remember my monkey banana analogy, my monkey banana explanation for why any of us do anything? That's the relationship. We're all monkeys motivated by bananas. Your bananas aren't necessarily my bananas, but we'll often find similar motivations among similar monkeys. So with this in mind, big food in the United States is a monkey. It is motivated by the banana of profit above all else. We, we in the United States are a capitalistic society. As such, the market demands uh, dictate the production and distribution of goods and services for profit. That's capitalistic, okay? So I'm going to give you two guesses what the big food monkeys are saying about these bills and the banning of these five chemicals. But your first guess doesn't count. You get two guesses and your first guess doesn't count. Well, here we go. A coalition of food industry companies wrote an opposition letter stating that, quote, all five of these additives have been thoroughly reviewed by the federal and state systems and many international scientific bodies and continue to be deemed safe, unquote. A spokesman for the National Confectioners Association, a trade organization that represents candy manufacturers, echoed this in an email, you don't say, saying their members adhere to FDA guidelines. Seriously, though, what would we expect the big food monkeys to say? Anything else? Anything but that? The big, uh, you know, big tobacco monkeys lied to us for decades and only ever told the truth when they were forced to because of lawsuits. It's the same thing going on here. Similar thing going on here. Maybe not exactly the same. Similar enough. So how are the big food monkeys able to get away with using harmful substances to produce our foods? Isn't the FDA on the lookout for toxic garbage in our food supply? Yes and no. They are, but they're really hamstrung. They're really overburdened. They're really understaffed. Um, and so on and so on. So remember, we have congressional monkeys. Everybody's a monkey. Everybody's got bananas. We have congressional monkeys motivated by the banana of money for re-election above all else. And the FDA is a monkey motivated greatly by the banana of money, either directly or indirectly, due to the laws and regulations imposed on the FDA by Congress. Congress sets both the total amount and appropriated 
they, they, Congress sets both the total amount of appropriated funds and the amount of user fees that the FDA is authorized to collect and obligate for each fiscal year. Congress sets that. The monkey, Congress monkey, motivated by money, sets the budget, um, sets the amount of appropriated funds and the amount of uh, user fees that the FDA is authorized to collect in every fiscal year. So let's see what our good old FDA, who is controlled by Congress, who is hamstrung, who can only do so much and doesn't want to really tick off Congress, can, can't violate law either. Um, and Congress is made it motiv uh, motivated by money. And how does Congress get money from lobbyists, from special interest groups representing big food? And round and round and round we go. So what did our good old FDA monkey have to say about this proposed five ingredient legislation ban? The FDA says, I'm going, to put this, I'm going to read this and just put it in quotes. The FDA said, the agency evaluates food additives based on a number of factors, including the amount expected to be consumed and laboratory studies supporting safety. It's just a patent answer, right? Um, I don't blame them. Uh, they, they do that, but that's, it, they're just, again, hamstrung, too ineffective, too overburdened, um, and too uh, controlled by the people that are being driven by the money banana in Congress to get reelected. Um, and a really nasty thing is that the big food doesn't even have to pass a new industrial additive through the FDA for approval to stick it in our food. They don't have to do that. Uh, big, food, big food can use in-house researchers, and if they find insufficient evidence to prove the new additive is harmful, it can be good to go. So new additives are innocent until proven guilty. They do not, most times, pass through the FDA for some rigorous scientific study and approval. No, they don't. And another thing about the over 3,000 industrial additives is they are often assessed for safety in animal research because it'd be inhumane to test them on humans. And they are tested individually. So this, uh, what was it, polypropyl barren? It would be tested individually. It would be tested to see what its toxicity is by itself without consideration of the barrage of exposures we're, we are all subjected to daily from air, water, soil, clothing, you just name it, right? Food we eat, everything that we're exposed to, all the toxic exposure, they don't take that totality into consideration. And the fact that there's an accumulation of the industrial additives and toxins uh, that we're exposed to, as I said, every single day in our modern environment, every single day. It's accumulating, it's cumulative, there's a totality to it. So to look at any single ingredient and say it's safe up to this, in what world, in what planet, in what universe are you talking about? So if we follow the money, then it makes sense. If we forget to follow the money, it can seem mind-boggling how otherwise really smart people, and so many of these people are really smart people, can ignore the fact that although one individual food may not have a potentially harmful exposure concentration, the fact that we eat so many different foods, it adds up in the body. And I'm going to expand this to what I said a minute ago. Not only the foods we eat that have all the industrial toxins, carcinogens, and um, and, and uh, chemicals that can be harmful harmful to us. It's our exposure in air, water, soil, you know, um, clothing, perfumes, detergents. It just goes on and on and on and on and on. Um, and I'm not going to drive myself with myself nuts with that stuff. I'm just going to do what I can, and that's what I'm, I'm going to suggest to all of you. This isn't a throw your hands up in the air and this is a defeatist and we're all beaten and yeah, no, not at all. We just do what we can. And one of the things we can do here, since such a massive um, focus of what we do here is on quality food and the food we're, we're consuming, we can put a, a great deal of our focus there as a start and get a tremendous benefit from it by removing these endocrine disruptors, these toxins, these carcinogens, these things with unknown 
hormonal, mental, emotional, physical, health, autoimmune effects. Um, you know, we need a complete overhaul of the FDA's review process, but how, how does that happen when Congress is the one that makes the laws and regulations that FDA has, that goes by, and there's a, you know, until there's a fundamental shift in how our system works, I don't, we can't wait for a top-down solution here. I've said it before, I'm going to keep saying that. We can't wait for them to fix it. I don't think it's going to be fixed in my lifetime, okay? I hope it's fixed in my, my grandchildren's lifetime, but I don't think it's going to be fixed in mine. So I'm not going to wait. I'm not defeatist. I'm just not going to count on them. And it's not about saying Congress is evil, the FDA is evil, and big food is evil. That's, that's not how I think. I just think it's important that we understand the relationship. We need to understand the relationship of how can these additives be okay? How can someone even come to the conclusion that they're okay without more research, without substantial research, and with the idea that we are taking into consideration the totality of all of our exposures to all of the industrial additives and toxins and carcinogens and things that are in our air, water, soil, clothing, texture, you name it. How? Um, we can do it because that's the way our system works. It's a capitalistic system. Capitalistic system. Congress, money, determine FDA's money. Big food feeds Congress to help make the laws bought and paid for. Round and round and round we go. I'm done with them. Can't rely on them. Do what you can. Best of luck. If you change fundamentally, gotcha. In the meantime, I can keep a positive mental attitude in my own life. I can keep a positive mental attitude on the choices that I'm making for myself, for my family, for my clients, for the things that I'm doing. And I can make a difference in my life, my family, my clients. And that's where I, that's where I live. I bring this message to you of, quote, hopelessness when it comes to the way our government works and the regulatory bodies and just that all that influence and blah and all that stuff. Um, because I just think it's important we know the relationship. And we, don't, and we don't count on it, all right? So, what do we do? We keep following our food principle number one. NFL number one, eat real food 95% of the time if you're in action, at least 90% of the time if you're in maintenance. Get a little bit more of a break if you're in maintenance on the real food. We're never gonna get away from it 100%. We're gonna be just fine, okay? But everything we can do to eat real food at least 90% of the time in maintenance, 95% of the time in action, we're going to do ourselves better. That's one of the things we're going to do. We don't need to rely on them. We don't need to wait for them. We don't need them to fix it for us to make those choices to eat real food that, that amount. Um, I'm going to suggest that you don't try and look. You read the packages. It's always good to read the back. Look at the ingredients. But I wouldn't worry yourself about looking to you know specifically for the five ingredients that I've covered in the review. Just eat real food. Real food doesn't really have any of these ingredients ever. Um, so if you're eating real food 90, 95% of the time, I wouldn't worry about it. I'm also, even though I, I talked about these five ingredients because these are the five ingredients that are in bills in the two states where they're looking to ban it, I typically don't look at single ingredients like that anyway because it's reductionist. And I just look at it from more of a ultra-processed food, period. Go to real food. Almost everything else is... is ultra processed. There are some things in the middle that are just minimally processed and those are fine. But um, anyway, uh, let's not bring it down to a reductionist thing where we only need to remove red dye number three. Just get rid of ultra processed foods as much as you can. Okay. Um, a good thing too is from the continued pressure from organizations like Consumer Reports and the Environmental Working Group, um, plus our collective voting, all of our collective voting with our pocketbooks where we buy less and less of the things that contain ingredients that weren't in great grandma's kitchen, big food is making some changes. Why? Because we're impacting their bananas, which is profit. They, they want to just sell us stuff we'll, we'll buy repeatedly over and over and over and over and over. I get it. Again, it doesn't make them evil. Profit, that's fine. But we can impact their motivation, the money motivation, by voting with our wallets and choosing uh, real food more often. They'll, they're getting the hint. Little, maybe forever too late, I don't know, but they are getting a hint and they are making some changes. Um, again, they care the most about profit, so we buy less of their Franken foods because we've had it with the lies, addiction, 
uh, that they cause and poor health that they cause. Um, they're changing what they put in our food supply and how our foods are packaged. So those are good things. So there is change occurring. Like I say I'm not holding I'm not holding my breath and I getting to the point where we're going to be like, wow, I'm I'm blown away at how awesome it is. We'll have to make those personal decisions for ourselves, but there are positive changes occurring and we can control what we can. So, you know, one of the tenets of serenity is accept what you cannot change, but have the courage to change what you can. So this is an area where we can have the courage to change what we can and not stay stuck in a, any kind of negative state. And I know you can hear some natural negativity from me when I, when I am talking about Congress and the FDA and the relationship of big food and the, you know, that, that triad. Um, but I'm human. And so I see it for what it is. I, I think I have a decent understanding of the relationship. And unless something fundamentally changes, it's going to be what it's going to be. Otherwise, then I, I leave that. I, then I don't, I don't stay there. I'm out of there and I, and I move on to the areas that I just, just covered with you. Like, what can I do? How can I help myself and my family and my clients and the people that I love? Um, and this is how I can do it. Make sure you've got the right message and hopefully the right attitude as you're going along um, regarding, you know, uh, positive, negative, you know, evil, all that kind of stuff. And I, I won't stay there. I don't really think of them that way. Okay. That's it for this week's State of Fitness. As always, find me if you need help. If you're a member, um, hit me up on campus. Send me a private message. If you're not a member, hit lluniversity.com. That's lluniversity.com. Fill out the contact form and it will get to me eventually. So until next time, let's focus on what we want. Let's be grateful for what we already have. And remember, it's all happening perfectly. Good night. I hope you have a great week. I'll see you here same bat time, same bat channel. All right, bye-bye.